All right. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I've entitled our message, The Art of Living is Loving. And so this is our our second piece of this chapter that we're taking, and I thought we'd just jump in once again, kind of like we did last week, and just reading it. And I went ahead and backed up in the the white letters behind me there. Uh, I thought we should pick it up in verse 4 for those that weren't here last week to be reminded at one of the best chapters in the Bible, and the best chapter on love for sure. And it says in verse 4, in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. And love endures all things. Now, where we're going to take this morning, starting in verse 8, that love never ends. Some of the translations say love never fails. This agape love. This love from above, that's what we're talking about here. This unconditional love. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they'll pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. And Paul says, when I was a a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. And so now faith and hope and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. I thought what we would do is kind of, it's laid out this way. There's a couple of a, we'll call them problem verses or where different churches uh, understand them a little differently. And I always like taking the, the fair road and saying, here's what some churches believe, here's what others believe, and here's why we end up believing that, and kind of where we land on that. And so we'll walk through a couple of those. And then just four points that in my studies on it uh, that just really hit my heart that I would like to, uh, uh, like to share. And so uh, with the first one here, uh, pops up in verse 10, but when the perfect comes. And so the question is, what does that mean? Who, who or what is the, the, the perfect? Because we know that these gifts that we've been studying about in chapter 12 and will again in chapter 14, that they're, they're ultimately, they're going to go away. The question is, did they already go away or are they still for today? And so with that, we're going to look at kind of the three main views of that. And so we're asking the question when the perfect comes, is that the completion of the New Testament, like at the end of the first century there? Uh, is it talking about Jesus? Is he the perfect one uh, that uh, is talking about his second coming, or thirdly, is it the perfect age when, when these gifts aren't going to be needed any longer? Which which one is it? So some interpret it to be the completion of the new uh, the New Testament. Thus, the gifts are not for today because they ceased, and so they're called uh, cessationist. But I seem to I find a problem down in verse twelve. Because it goes on to say, if they've already ceased, now we are already, we already see face to face. No, we haven't seen Jesus face to face yet. And we're fully, we fully know God like he fully knows us. No, that has, hasn't happened yet either. So I, I don't see that one as being the one. Some interpret it to be Jesus' return. There's similar wording by John in 1 John uh, 3, 2. He says, beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, like looking out to the future, but we know that when he is revealed, so there's that terminology there when Christ comes back, when he's revealed, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. It's what Spurgeon would call the beatific vision, to finally be able to see the face of God, looking out into the future that that hasn't happened yet, so Christ's return. The third one, some interpret it to be the completion or the maturation, the maturing, or the perfection of the church. So it's, it's tied with the second coming of Christ and our church being, the church, excuse me, around the world being perfected or made complete. These are called, this grouping uh, that believes this is called continuationists. We believe that the gifts continue, that they're still continuing until this second coming, until the church is made perfect. So I think this one holds the most weight as it flows best in the context of what the following verses there. 
And literally, literally that, that word perfect, it's the state of perfection comes. When the state of perfection comes, and that's what we're looking for, and that's what will happen when Christ comes. And so Paul speaks of the slow maturing process from, into, uh, from infancy to all the way up until adulthood, that it's a, a, time, uh, a time frame, uh, one day ending in Paul seeing God as God now sees Paul. One day partial knowledge would be displaced by the perfect knowledge of God. And even Jesus uses this term in Matthew 5, 48. Therefore, you shall be, speaking of the future, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. That our perfection or completion will be just like, not that we're going to become gods, not that we're in that way, but we're going to be complete. There's nothing else we're working on. We're not fighting against sin anymore and all of that. And so uh, that's where it seems to uh, fit in beautifully there. Secondly, a little bit further down, we see in a mirror dimly, just a couple kind of historical or cultural things to know, uh, that how, how do we move from a, looking at a, a mirror where you're kind of seeing a reflection, but it's not perfect, until all of a sudden becoming really clear. Do you know that Corinth, uh, the church that Paul was writing to, is actually known for their mirrors? You know, the mirrors that you and I look into today that are an exact reflection of who you are, unless you're at the gym, and then they make you look a little, little buffer when you're looking at that, I guess. But, but usually in our mirrors, when we look in them and we see perfectly clear, they didn't come around to the 13th century. And so with that, what, what were they using back then was what? Polished metals, like polished brass, usually had kind of a, either concave or, or what's the other one? Yeah, that one. And so with that, and so you'd see a reflection, but it was kind of like moving it around a little bit to, to, to catch your face to be able to kind of see it. So it's giving a good uh, reflection, but not perfect. And so we see when, when Christ comes, the, the clarity of seeing our, our own reflection now in a stream looking into the water where you can see the reflection that's there, but one day face to face. He also mentions this faith and hope and love, this triplets of uh, Christian piety here, and that love is better than, and that's where we have to land with the chapter. Love is better than really good things. Love is better than all of the different gifts because they're not going to last, but love will be forever. And so with that, from that standpoint, because love is eternal. And so what he's reminding us of as we're reading 12 and 14, why 13 is placed here, it's this reminder, rightly prioritize your view of gifts in the light of love. Let's not get so enamored with the gifts. They are awesome, and he's going to continue to talk about them. And Paul's saying, I speak in tongues more than you all. They're good things, good things. But love takes the notch right above that because it's eternal. All right, so one of the first four that I was looking at is you and I, we love on levels when we talk about love. So I love Kelly, I love my children, I love a good cup of coffee, love Mexican food, uh, I love my hobbies, and I love our dog, usually. And so with that, I have different levels and ranking of my loves and steps or groupings, classifications, however you want to see that. When you and I use our English word love, we just use it for all of these things, those closest to us, you and I, we love much more than a stranger that we've never met before. It's part of who we are. It's part of how we work, how we think, how we feel. And so with that, that's where we're fallible in this way. For you and I to understand this agape love, this unconditional love, can you ever say that your love is unconditional? Like there's times where I'm, I'm aiming for that, I'm trying to be that, but there's times where I don't even know. It, it, it feels, even the, the best I can get it, it still feels, but I don't even know me some of the times or, or why I'm doing it. And there's nothing behind it. There's not hoping something I, I get back from my love for Kelly, not hoping to get something from that, you know. And so it's just like we struggle with that. We're fallible in this way. But listen to this. God is not. See, human love is oftentimes object-oriented. It's usually object-oriented, where God's love is subject-oriented. God doesn't know levels of love. I want you to think about that. He doesn't know levels of love or variations of love like we do. He knows perfect love. He knows one love, agape. He knows love that is unconditional. And so I thought the best in focusing on this chapter is focusing on our, our second point that God is love from 1 John 4, 8. 
See, love already is the, the greatest. We know that. It's the top of the list of attributes and all of these things. But not only because it outlasts the other virtues that are beautiful and necessary as they are, but because it inherently is greater by being the most God-like. That God would say in defining himself, there's only four in Scripture where it says God is such and such. Some say five, whichever one you want to pick. But it's four or five, right? There, there's only a few. And so to, to raise to the top of the list that, that who he is and explaining himself that God is, is love. God is love. He, God does not have faith or hope. He doesn't need either, but he is love. Love does not define God, but God defines love. And the way, why, why we say it that way, that you might kind of be taken back a little bit by that first one. Wait, love doesn't define God? No, it's only one of the attributes, right? It doesn't fully define God out, right? There's so many other things that we can learn about our God and who he is. So it doesn't define God, but God defines love because of that statement. I like this. Love is a language God is fluent in. Thinking of it that way. Think of it as a language for a moment. Love is a language God is fluent in and that we are trying to learn. It's like we just downloaded Rosetta Stone or Babel. Maybe not Babel because that's back in Genesis and a different connotation. But let's say Rosetta Stone, right? And you're trying to learn a language. I think every single one of us in this room has tried to learn a language. I think we had to in high school, right? And so with that, some of us advanced further on. Some of you have two languages, three languages down. Congratulations. I'm so jealous of you. And, and with it in my travels, I'd always try to get the alphabet down, be able to count to 20 and be able to have basic words before traveling there. I just love language in that, in, in that way. It's, it's so incredible. But to think of that that way, love is a language God is fluent in and that you and I are simply trying to learn. It was so cute, McCall. My daughter sent me a, um, a video to our family chat that we we're on and it's her little one and a half year old, little Joey. And uh, they're moving to Thailand next summer. And uh, so uh, she just learned how to count one to 10 in Thai. And so, oh, it was so cute. Just bless my heart. All right, sorry, not in notes, stick to notes. We, we are loved by God. When you hear that statement, though, and think of you, that you're loved by God, it doesn't mean that you're pitied by God. You might think God loves a lot of other people, but probably not me. He just puts up with me, right? And, or, or he pities me. But that, that, no, that's not true. He delights in you, every one of us. He delights in us as an artist, delights in his work, as a father, delights in his son, Every once in a while, you, you come across something just so profound in Scripture. Reading it, devotions, for my sake, a lot of times it's I'm digging deep into the study of it. And so looking at that, and here, here's my statement. The father loves Brian as much as he loves Jesus. He can't love Jesus more than me. He doesn't love Jesus more than me. That's out of John chapter 17 and verse 23. I'll put it up behind me there. Jesus' prayer, that's the chapter where we intimately get to step into this intimate moment of Jesus praying to the Father. The whole chapter is his prayer, all red letters, right? And as he's going through that, he hits this in 23, and Jesus says, I and them and you and me, talking about the Father, that they may become perfectly one. So just as we're one, that we would become one is, is what his prayer is. So that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. It's the even as statement. We are the them. That's bad English, but incredible truth. We are the them. Love them even as you loved me. That's powerful. He loves us with such a perfect love. A love that you and I haven't even begun to understand. It's untainted love. We've never loved anyone like this to this level as hard as we try, yet we still ask God. We're loved in this way. He's explained it this way. The Father who so loved the world that he sent his only Son, that Father there loves us today like he loves Christ. And yet you and I still say, if you love me, why did you let this happen to me? 
or my family, or this disease, or a loss of a child, or whatever else, and we still get in his face about, do you really love me? We can't own it sometimes. It's difficult. Or we're ticked off at him for something happening in our lives that we're so shocked about and saying, if you love me. But you and I, we can even trust with, trust God when someone else sins against us. We can even trust him in that. See, remember, other sins is what placed Jesus on the cross, and look what the Father did with that. He's able to take even people sinning against you, which you can't control, right? Somebody sins against you in that way. But even in that, we can trust God in that situation and what he's going to do with it. Because look what he did with Christ on the cross, where he had all of your sin, my sin, everyone's sin, from back in the first century, all of our sins to present day. You know, there's no fear of someone who loves you unconditionally like that. This love is given to you by God, not when you're on your A game, not when you're deserving of it. He's not waiting for you to get good, good enough, holy enough. Now it's given to you at your lowest. When you don't like him, don't care about him, don't know him, don't, don't even care if he existed, maybe running in the exact opposite direction from him. It's when he smiled and said, here I am, come unto me. In the midst of us running as fast as we could the other way. And he's whispering down, come unto me, come unto me. The Father loves the Son, the Son loves us, and we in turn are to love others. With this love that we can't conjure up ourselves, but we have to rely upon him from the day of salvation, pouring that love into our hearts to be able to pour out unto others. And so how do we do that? He wraps up his whole prayer, same chapter, John 17, wraps it up, very last verse, he says that, the love with which you have loved me, Jesus saying, the love you have loved me, Father, may be in them, same love, and I in them. The reason how you and I are able to do the best we can in sharing this agape love with the world is because it resides inside of us and because Christ resides inside of us. And so this is to be a love that flows deep and wide and passes over any rocks of petty differences. Christian love is visible and tangible. God not only tells us he loves us, but he, he shows it. I always challenge people, go through the four Gospels, show me one place where he walks up to somebody and says, hi, my name's Jesus and I love you. Of him telling somebody that he loves him. No, instead, he hangs on a cross and shows them, I love you. And so our, our third one behind me there is Romans 5, verse 8, but God demonstrates, right? That love, anytime it's used in the whole New Testament, it's always a verb, right? There's action to it, not just saying I love you. It's not just the feeling goes way beyond feelings, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ had you on his mind. And so true love demonstrates and illustrates and proves and confirms itself See, Christian love is visible, it's tangible, and should be radical. There's a fun word, eschatological love, right? Eschatos simply uh, means last, and so we talk about the last times or the end times, the future, right? And so that's all that big word means, right? But it's an eschatological love because Paul says something here about the future in relation to the present. Like, wait, why does he bring in end times, talking about one day, it's this way now, but later it's going to be and when the perfect comes and, and your perfection is made and looking out into the future. And so he's talking about this end time stuff coming up and it's all based in this, this love. What's, what's happening here? What does eschatology have to do with ethics? What does the new heaven and the new earth for which we long have to do with my moral struggles here? I'm glad you've asked and I'm here to tell you. Love is not our duty, it's our destiny. Love is not our duty, it's our destiny. Again, going back to it being a, a language, if you will, love is the language they speak in the new creation, and you and I get to start learning it here. We don't have to wait till there to get it figured out. Just like little Joey is doing in counting to tie, she can get to one through ten. It's impressive. I taught my daughter when she was two, 
to count to 10 in Hebrew. <laughs> and so, right? And so sometimes we're just struggling with it like that. We, we know a few words, we know a little bit of vocabulary. One day we're going to be fluent, but we get to practice it today. N.T. Wright, on an article that he wrote on this, he said, oh, it is difficult, this, this love. This love language we don't fully know yet. Oh, it's difficult. There are a lot of irregular verbs, he says. There's vocabulary that will be very difficult to, to get into your head and twist your tongue around it, but learn it. It's like trying to roll the, you know, the Spanish R's, right? And in, 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 in different languages, in different tonations, especially in all the Asian languages. And, and it, it's, it's difficult and, and hard to do oftentimes in training, and it's hard. But guess what? One day we're going to be singing it. One day we're going to be singing it. And faith and hope are pretty much the same. You have to practice those in our lives, right? Hope in Scripture means not just optimism, be hopeful, but total trust that the creator God is the God of the future. I have hope that he's coming again. But it's not like hope he comes back, right? It's, it's, it's an anticipation, it's truth. It is coming. It is going. And so I have that hope in me, right? That, that's what it's speaking to. And then with faith, it's the utter trust in God, the creator and the redeemer. And so looking at faith at that moment, uh, faith is very hard to practice. It's like learning a difficult sport. For those of you that have tried golfing, right? I remember a, a friend gave me some informal lessons back when I used to try to play. And, but with it, you know, when you first start playing, you grab it like a baseball bat. and You just try to hit it as hard as you can. At least that's what I tried to do. And finally, a friend probably couldn't handle it anymore. It's just like, can I show you how to grip? And I'm thinking, that's one of the basics. I got this. And he says, now you take your pinky and you lock it in here. And he's showing me. And it's, I said, I feel so unnatural. But after hundreds of swings, all of a sudden it starts becoming more natural. Didn't help my game much, but hey, maybe it did for you. But the, the, the point being, right, all of a sudden it's something that's so uncomfortable, all of a sudden the more you're, you're working with it. And so seeing faith that way, seeing hope that way, seeing our love in that way I think is helpful. And so it is unnatural. Faith is unnatural, even awkward at times, but it's like that grip. Let somebody teach you. Always be a learner, forever being a learner in that area. One day, one day, you and I, we're going to know as we are, are known. And lastly, the permanency of, of love. I'm sure you've read this before. I got Romans 8 behind me there, just for 38 and 39. I lifted it out of the New Living Translation because it flows so beautifully and very poetic. Uh, but with that, I, I pray that you would hear it yourself and hear the promise behind, we talked about God being love, but this is really how he loves, or the, um, again, the eternality of it, the, the permanence of it. And so Paul says in this passage, I, I am convinced that each one of these words you can do a Bible study on. He's, he's, Paul's fully convinced. He's not like been thinking about this one lately. I am convinced that nothing Nothing means nothing. I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's what? God's love. That's what we're talking about here. Nothing can separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. I like that phrasing. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God. That is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Can you sit and just kind of own that for a second and just thank him and, and, and just, just be enamored by that type of, of love? That, that if God says, I love you, and has demonstrated, not only said it, but, but demonstrated it, that he should never have to say it again. I mean, it's, it's so powerful, but, but in that, he goes to this length of just breaking this apart to be able to say nothing. And by nothing, I mean all of these things and anything else, right? It's not an exhaustive list, but we can know that and we can own that. So good. So who can separate us from his love? That's clear. No one. Why? Because you and I, we're, we're secure sheep. We're advantaged sheep. We're acquitted sheep. We're conquering sheep. And we're loved sheep especially love sheep. So understand, saints, you cannot exhaust this topic. 
will forever be learners of love. And when true love is the standard, we fall short. This is the whole point of the gospel. And so in that, that's how I want to wrap up, because reminding us, so what are we supposed to do with it? Well, for the gospel's sake and, and, and looking at that, that's, that's the point of the gospel. I know you can't do it. I can't do it. We need him. Holy Spirit, fill us with your love. Help us to show that type of love. Help us to go for it. Don't just say, oh, I can't do that kind of love. Nope. We need to go for it. When pure self-sacrificial life-giving love with no expectations in return is the standard, of course we're all going to fall short in some way. We're simply supposed to be being conformed into his image, yes, but also into his love. See it the same way. So as believers, we can't approach this text and swing one way or the other. You can't express perfect love. You can't just say, I, I can't express perfect love. I'm not God, and I'm not perfect, so I'm not going to try. So that's one side of it, right? And the other side is, nailed it. Look what I did. Look how I loved, right? Those are the two extremes. Okay, so we're not on either one of those. We're aiming for that, shooting towards that, not just walking away saying, I can't be like Jesus. But instead, no, see it as a language that I'm learning, and I'm trying to do better. And I'm picking up more, more, more vocabulary as we go. And when shoots of agape love come springing up out of our lives, it's only because of the source of love that lives inside of us. That is God himself. We're going to end with this song, and I'll uh, invite up our worship team at this time. Frederick Laham, uh, Lehman, excuse me, uh, he was a lyrics and composer. He was around the middle 1800s, the middle 1900s. And uh, he wrote this beautiful poem that became a hymn. Could we with ink the ocean fill? So we fill up the whole entire ocean with ink. And were the skies of parchment made, right? The whole skies of parchment. Were every stalk on earth a quill? So you go to Iowa, all the corn stalks there, we all grab one, right? And every man and woman a scribe by trade. To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. And just a little factoid before we sing it. He wrote stanzas one and two. He didn't write that one. That one was actually found on, and I know we don't use this term anymore, but back in the day, it's called an insane asylum. This was penciled in. It was found penciled on the wall of a patient's room in an insane asylum after he had been carried to his grave. They went back to the room, went to clean it up, and that's what was sketched on there. It was actually a, a, a poet, an Aramaic uh, poem um, called Hadamut uh, that that was taken from, but so rich. And I'd like us to stand and sing it. And so let me pray for us first. Father, we pray for this love from above. We, we pray, God, that once again, even today, pour it fresh into our hearts. We need your help with it pouring it into us. A lot of us for our own minds and hearts, letting it absorb just for ourselves, realizing how loved we are. And then also to be able to share that love with others. We pray for your help. Help us to learn this language of love. In Jesus' name, amen.